nobody is being real with the British people about the scale of the housing crisis. The the evidence is very clear on this. I'm very unpopular for pointing this out on social media and elsewhere, but if you read serious, independent, rigorous institutes, Migration Advisory Committee, the Migration Observatory at Oxford, they all basically say the same thing, which is it is clear that mass immigration is, is worsening the housing crisis by pushing up rents in places like London, where on average 20 people go for the same flat, um, and by driving up house prices. So for every 1% increase in the uh, uh, population, you get a one percent increase in house prices, basically. So, hmm. you know, it's 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 it it's it. The evidence, I think, is clear. And then when you get to the, you know, the most need the needy um, people in society, the people who really do need help through social housing, the vast majority of social housing in London, um, uh, lots of social housing in London, I should say, is is going to people who are not even born in Britain. So if you look, for example, at uh, the stats in London, um, you know, around about half of social housing in London is going to people who weren't born in Britain. About 70% of Somali families in London are in social housing, to give you one stat. And so imagine what this looks like if you're in your 20s or your 30s and you're a young professional. Let's say you're a British kid, you've played, you've played by the rules, you've gone to university, you've got a degree, you've come into Westminster, you're working, you know, in politics or a you know, professional company, you're paying, let's say, a thousand pounds a month to live in a pretty um, rubbish flat where you're probably living next to some dubious characters in a neighborhood that's pretty depressing um, and declining uh, on the periphery of London. You've got to get up in the morning, take the train into town. You've got to go past all this nice social housing in more affluent neighborhoods, which turns out isn't actually um, being lived in by by people um you know who are British, and um, that's gonna that's gonna suck for a lot of young British graduates. In fact, I work with a lot of young British graduates, and I know that's exactly how they feel. And what we haven't really got here in this country is a serious, sensible national conversation about how migration is impacting not just housing, but impacting public services, is impacting levels of crime, impacting social cohesion impacting multiculturalism and the extent to which it's working, uh, impacting national identity, impacting shared values. We're not allowed to actually have a serious conversation about migration because the two big parties are now basically saying the same thing, which is let's keep having more of it. Mm. Let's not question it. Let's keep having more of it. Now, why do they say that? Because they, firstly, on the left, it's about virtue signaling and moral righteousness. But for conservatives, it is fundamentally about supplying the economy with lots of bodies to keep big mm, business happy, mm. to keep cheap, to keep labor, migrant labor as cheap as possible, to keep profits and consumption high. And then what happens as we sit here in early 2024, well, we get the economic data, which says, well, after 20 years of mass migration, Britain's in recession. But more importantly than that, our GDP per head numbers, m meaning productivity per person, are, are dismal. And mm. they have been dismal for a long period of time. Now, all the British people are told is, Mass migration equals good economy, mm. right? So have more migration, you get a better economy, you get a better public services. Clearly, that is not happening. What we've had is 20 years of mass migration. We have a weak economy, which is not growing, not productive, um, not innovative. It, it, we remove any incentive for companies to invest in um, British kids or British workers and all of that. And we just go round and round in this Ponzi scheme and everybody's too scared to call it out and everybody is too scared to challenge it, even though the evidence is quite clear. Mass immigration is bad economics. I, I'll say one thing. It's not just young professionals that you give that example. I used to work in Bow in East London and the uh, priority housing has been given to large, uh, large amounts of people from the Bengali community, mm. which means that working class White Brits have been pushed out where their, their mothers and grandmothers might still live in Bow. They are no longer able to buy housing there, so they end up getting pushed further out of mm. London. And it's not a coincidence that that part of Bow is also where there are some BNP pubs. It's where the, the, the a kind of a people's, uh, you might want to say, far right mm. re, re, uh, reaction to, to those groups, mm. even when it's actually the policy perhaps that they are so... Infrastra uh, infuriated with um, well they should be frustrated with the policy because it's completely ridiculous I do have a very clear and strong view on this I, which is that it is the job of the nation state fundamentally to prioritize the people 
who have contributed to that nation state over a long period of time. Mm. That is my one of my founding principles in my personal politics. So when we have a system whereby we're able to find housing for senior lieutenants in Hamas, as an example, mm -hmm. who are living in North London in, and were living in social housing, then got access to right to buy, and we've got you know British kids struggling to get onto the housing ladder, we need to talk about that as a society, and we need to talk about how is it mm. that we created a politics that even made that possible, and yeah. why are we not allowed to talk about it? Or at least when we do talk about it, why are we often talking about it outside of the mainstream public square? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think many people are, I hope, beginning to see that this link between mass migration and housing is a very, very troubling one. Now, you, you just published some statistics on housing percentage ownership. And though mm. it's plummeted, particularly for the younger age mm. groups since the 70s, in the last five, 10 years, it seems to be picking up again. Mm. What do you make of that? Well, I think it's too early to say. Um, I think probably there are you know some things going on there in terms of intergenerational wealth transfer, mum and dad passing money down. We had a number of schemes during COVID. You know, we changed stamp duty and things like that, mm -hmm. which probably encouraged people into the housing market. We're certainly not building anywhere near enough yeah. housing to for that to accommodate for that slight uptick. But basically, if you're between eighteen and forty compared to your predecessors in you know past generations, you know, you've been screwed. Yeah. Basically, you are not on the housing ladder. And until you inherit some housing or you inherit some wealth in order to get onto that housing ladder, you are going to be having a very difficult time indeed. And I think the evidence on that is pretty clear. That also goes some way, I think, to explaining why only 10% of Zoomers from Gen Z um, and only about, I think, 15, 20% of millennials are planning to vote for the Conservative Party mm -hmm. because, you know, they're looking at a party that has essentially chosen, again, after Brexit, to prioritise mass migration over fixing these long-term problems within British society. Housing is one. The NHS is another. Social care is another. Universities is, is another. Consistently in all of these issues, right, mass immigration is used as a sticking plaster to cover the deeper problems and challenges that we face as a society. We are never going to have, look, let me be blunt, you can have mass immigration or you can have available, affordable housing. You can't have both. Mm. 